You see, the title, um, I would like to refer to the background image you see here. Actually, it tells the whole story. We simply have to interpret it. You see all the big high mountains uh, in southern, central Asia, eastern Asia, and it's quite obvious and it's quite clear that uh, these mountains have a great importance uh, for the water supply of this whole continent. And uh, it's also quite clear that it's uh, differentiated between the more arid areas which are showing up in this light tone here, where actually irrigation is predominant and uh, that means that uh, economy, population and so on totally depends on these water resources. Whereas in these areas here, which are much more dark, we have mainly rain-fed agriculture, nevertheless most of these uh, big rivers originating from the Central uh, Asian high mountains also, of course, traverse these uh, uh, forelands here. So, of course, I will not stay now with this picture. I uh, have to go on and I just have to find out whether I manage this. I would like to uh, speak about four or present four uh, aspects very shortly what I just said here, maybe a little bit in, more, in a more focused way, uh, the South Asian water towers, then uh, as an introduction to understand why the discussion today is so much focused on these areas, I shortly present the Indus Plain as the world's uh, largest irrigation network, and then the question, too much water, too little water, that's uh, a very uh, famous title, there are books written exactly with this title, and it's really something which is uh, of high political relevance. And finally, and there I might my, my use a little bit uh, more time, or maybe the focus will be put on this here, uh, what just has been mentioned before, that of course there is a lot of research now going on in these areas, and uh, actually we are just developing uh, Upper Indus uh, River Basin program, uh, which is internationally concentrated, and uh, uh, about this I would like to say a few more words. Now, uh, have a close look up to the western part, Indus, uh, and you will realize I will mainly speak about now this Pakistani uh, context where we have uh, the western Himalayas. The, uh, Karakorum and the eastern part of the Hindu Kush, and it's quite obvious, and you can outline here quite easily uh, that we have within a rather arid environment, quite obviously, uh, a line of uh, different as uh, landscape type. It's all irrigated area here, actually ranging from the mountains down to the Arabian Sea. The Indus River as the main river in this area, uh, that's quite important, has its source or its origin actually in the uh, Himalayan area uh, itself. Not in the front range, it's uh, between uh, the western Himalaya and then the central Himalaya and here Karakorum and so on. Uh, it, origins, or it's originate, it originates uh, in the Kailash area, which is actually the main spring area for Brahmaputra, uh, Indus, Ganges, and other rivers uh, in this area. And it's quite clear, that's uh, in a very simple way uh, expressed, that these mountains really serve as water towers. Uh, you can see, and just these two figures, that in the case of Pakistan, 80% of the agricultural area is irrigated, that this area here, as indicated, and 90% of the agricultural production is actually, uh, or comes out of these areas here. So the rest, 10% uh, is mainly uh, in the foothills of the mountains or within the mountain ranges. Having a look at uh, the high mountain systems, I simply would like to show two, three slides which uh, somehow illustrate this situation. In the central Karakorum, 
which uh, we are looking towards the east, K2 would be somewhere up here. Uh, we have huge glaciers and high up area which uh, is elevated in these regions here. Uh, these snow fields are between 5,000 uh, or up to 5,500. Many of the peaks are ranging uh, or reaching 8,000 meters above sea level. We have many, many uh, very extended glacier systems coming down into the valleys. Uh, for instance, here a very strange structure. I will come back to this surging glacier which moves from these high plateaus down into the valleys. A similar structure you can see here. Or uh, here from a Google, another Google Earth uh, view, uh, the setting in the central mountains uh, of the landscape. You can see again these high mountains with K2, the second highest mountain in the world. Uh, snow covers in the upper part, uh, parts, then uh, all in all rather arid land, uh, uh, valleys, and the green areas uh, here are actually the irrigated areas in the valley bottoms. These are all irrigated fields because most of the slopes and also the valleys almost don't get any rainfall, they are arid and they totally depend on the runoff of these uh, meltwater uh, tributaries and once more uh, irrigation is the almost the only way uh, to have some kind of production down there. To say, and that's uh, this picture I will show again later on, that the irrigated fields don't uh, or are not fed by these rivers here, but from the side valleys, from melting water from the glaciers, uh, because simply uh, it was simply not possible to lift up the water <coughs> to these plains here. And on the other hand, it's not possible really to settle in the valleys. So they are settlements and so on are all a little bit lifted above. When you go further down, uh, you follow then uh, the Indus River, that's the Indus River here, uh, through deep gorges uh, where the river uh, turns from uh, these uh, western direction to the southern direction, cuts through uh, the Hindu Kush area here through Khoisan and it's a deeply incised uh, situation here. You always can see, or already can see, that we have some vegetation on the slopes. You can uh, guess there are some forests. That means uh, the more you come to the front ranges, the more you are exposed to the monsoon systems, which are, of course, then on the south slope, totally dominating. So we have very, very distinct gradients of humidity from south to north, but also from the lowlands to the highlands. And this will be one of the issues we have to discuss. Uh, very sorry for this uh, somehow unsharp uh, slide. It simply should uh, show once the waters have left the mountains, you get huge plains, you get a huge river system uh, which slowly moves uh, down to the Arabian Sea and which actually feeds all these irrigated oases uh, we have seen at the very beginning. Now, uh, let's have a short look to uh, the Indus Plain as it said the world's largest irrigation network. Here, once more, you have a map of this whole system. It's uh, superimposed again uh, on a satellite image. Now you can see uh, that the, the Indus has its source actually in an area which nowadays is China, it belongs to China. Then we have an Indian portion, finally a Pakistani, and from the western side uh, also uh, Af Afghanistan and an Afghan contribution through Kabul River here. So Indus River is the main river here, but we have many contributing tributaries, Jelen, Chenna, Ravi, Beas, Sadlech, I think from school time we know all these names. But all in all, they feed uh, the Indus system. Or was that wrong? You don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a very uh, schematic uh, outline you can see once more 
how it looks like uh, the Indus, then the different uh, tributary uh, rivers, uh, mainly from nowadays in the part here. And there is one question, and which uh, actually is the main question of the country's economy and uh, policy management and so on, how to manage these uh, resources, these river water resources for domestic use, for irrigation, for energy production. Because it's quite clear, these rivers of course uh, flow along their riverbeds and the plains outside have somehow uh, to be um, reached by technical means. And how it really looks like, that's a, a, a graph uh, which I got from BAPTA, Water and uh, Energy Production Agency. And it shows a system how uh, in the early 20th century up to now, engineers managed to reach actually the whole area, the whole uh, flat land. There are two or two or three different structures which I don't go into the details, simply would like to mention. You see, these are main channels which uh, actually serve to divert the waters from the western rivers into the eastern rivers here in order, in order to feed them and to get enough water in these uh, areas here. Sometimes vice versa, but that's the main idea. To feed uh, these river systems here. The second thing is, you see, well, this is uh, actually uh, possible through the erection and construction of barrage. These are not real big dams, but just barrage across uh, these rivers. They enable to let water through, but also to divert water. And then, of course, you have a number, a huge number, and these are just a few here, uh, secondary channels, which then feed uh, the agricultural areas, uh, a whole system from actually the foothills down to uh, uh, the Arabian Sea. <coughs> what is also shown here is uh, this line, which is uh, today, nowadays, the international boundary between India, uh, in the eastern part here, and Pakistan here. And this is, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know about these things as well. That was one of the real, real difficult issues uh, after partition, when uh, after the Second World War, when the Indian subcontinent became independent. Uh, this was one of the critical issues. Who is actually controlling these water systems here? Again, I don't go into the details. I simply can refer to a set of international and national treaties. They are uh, the very big one, uh, Indus, Indus Water Treaty uh, dates back to 1960 and it had follow up and it really regulated in detail uh, how these uh, water rights between the countries, India and uh, Pakistan, have to be understood who has access, how much water has to be released uh, from India into Pakistan. That was one thing. The second thing that within Pakistan, uh, now this is not shown on this picture, we have provinces. There is Punjab up here, we have the Sindh province here, we have uh, uh, Baluchistan here on the west, we have uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa up here. Also these uh, different uh, provinces had uh, or tried to get enough water, it's quite clear. The ones up here are in a privileged situation and it has to be made sure that also within Pakistan it's guaranteed that enough water comes down here. Anyway, uh, that's a continuing discussion and, and a lot of cheating, a lot of um, uh, dip diplomatic uh, crisis, one has to say. During some of the wars between India and Pakistan, India immediately uh, tried to stop or divert the waters. It was a, it was a, a weapon in this uh, context. At the same time, and that is now a problem which science is a little bit suffering, because this is such a critical issue between the countries, data on the runoff 
are somehow kept secret. There is not a free exchange of data. Sometimes they are manipulated because it's quite clear if you say, for instance, 50% of a certain amount of water has to be released to the neighboring country, it very much depends. What is 100%? So uh, it's quite understandable that there is a, a real, real big discussion. At the same time, uh, there are problems that the infrastructure of this uh, system is very much suffering. It's uh, partially outdated and very, very costly to repair it, to extend it, to maintain it and to optimize it. Just two uh, pictures how this uh, actually looks like. You see one of these secondary channels here going through, then uh, of course it's diverted from this side to tertiary and then, and so on, finally, all these fields are uh, irrigated. I don't go now into the discussion who has real uh, rights on these waters. There's a big discussion on, you know, the big landlords who have access to it, small farmers who are at the tail ends of these channels, who are very often not anymore f uh, fed uh, with water and are really suffering. It's a big fight within uh, the Pakistani society on this and uh, also international loans very much are linked to uh, find new ways to have a fair distribution of this world. The consequences of uh, these uh, regulations between the countries you can see on this slide here also from Google Earth, uh, that is uh, the national boundary between India on this side, Pakistan on this side, it's just a small section of course, which clearly indicates obviously here we have other uh, rights of access to these channels here, uh, whereas in this case uh, India had to, or is, is uh, in a shortage, it's rather south here. So you can see, if you interpret uh, satellite pictures quite clearly where uh, obviously an rather guaranteed access to these waters is uh, still possible and where obviously uh, some contracts or so uh, create problems. Now, one of the discussions uh, which is really, uh, I think, again and again uh, also in the international uh, discussion visible, too much water, too little water. And I simply would like to remind that Two, now almost three years ago, uh, this huge Indus flood, what was uh, in all our uh, media uh, discussed, and it was considered as to be one of the biggest uh, catastrophes uh, related to uh, runoff of uh, rivers of too much water in this case. It's uh, an event which uh, it started in the high mountains, it goes to one of the uh, cities up there, and you get an impression with about the power of uh, the water which came down there. And it was not just one flood, there were three uh, floods within a few uh, weeks, all had to be uh, linked to a very specific atmospheric circulation. Those who are a little bit familiar with climatology maybe remember that exactly at the same time, this was uh, July. 2007 in August, it repeated the same, more or less the same. In Russia, uh, there were huge forest fires, extreme drought, and it goes back to a circulation pattern, uh, you know, Rossby wave, which was very stable for weeks, which is actually exceptional. And it was considered, is this linked to what we say climate change or what has it to do? Anyway, the situation in the highlands was dramatic and very, very destructive. It destroyed infrastructure. Uh, it's just one example. You could take hundreds of bridges, of roads, which were more or less totally destroyed. This is uh, a, a bridge across, a suspension bridge across Indus. That's Indus River D. If you go, or if you, uh, those days in the lowlands, uh, you can see this comparison. It's uh, near Sukhul, that's uh, somewhere in the central part of uh, the Indus River in the plains. That's how it looks uh, during normal uh, 
normal uh, conditions, weather conditions. You see the Indus coming down here. There are uh, uh, contributing rivers here. There are channels uh, diverted. That's one of these barrages and so on. When the flood came, all this was more or less covered. Some areas like Sukur itself was more or less uh, protected, but um, a big number of farmers who had their irrigated fields here were totally drowned. Their land disappeared, borders disappeared, which made it almost impossible in many cases after the flood has receded to find your field. There was a big fight, where is my field? It has changed landscape and that was a real big problem. These pictures, uh, it's just from uh, uh, the media, it also was spread all over the world and it shows some idea, some impression of this dramatic situation. Uh, and the result uh, that uh, was Oxfam Australia has finally mapped the results of this flood, which was still in December, uh, in September, it's indicated here, like this, the blue areas are the flooded areas which were still uh, underwater in September, that means months after uh, this whole thing has happened and then with these colors uh, the affected uh, districts and uh, here some summaries of uh, the losses. Interestingly enough that uh, most of the lost lives happened actually in the mountain areas or in the foothills because there the flood immediately, you didn't have time to escape. Whereas in the lower parts uh, it took 10 days, uh, maybe two weeks until the water has reached these areas, people somehow could uh, escape. Nevertheless, some 20 million people uh, all in all have been affected, that's 10% or even more of the total population of Pakistan has been heavily affected and uh, infrastructure was damaged and almost a total loss of the harvest uh, which created hunger problems and uh, initiated uh, international help. Now, that was too much water. But in the long run, and that is no question, water scarcity will be the real problem. And the question is, water scarcity, that means less water. Now, what does it mean, less water? Is it less water in the rivers, maybe due to climate change? Or is it water which uh, is less available to people? And there is one thing, and that is really, really, I would say, a frightening perspective. Looking at the demographic development, you can see that uh, just shortly after independence, Pakistan had below 50 million uh, inhabitants, actually 38 million in 1947. Now it has reached some 50 or say 60 years later, uh, roughly 200 million. And the perspectives, and that is uh, from World Bank, uh, they depend a little bit on the, on the model and the forecast model it will rise up uh, up in the next uh, now almost 40 years up to 350 to 500 million people. That's a real uh, dramatic situation because it reduces the availability of water, of course, uh, dramatically. Uh, whether the figures are uh, realistic or not, that's another question. It was World Bank uh, was actually using seven models. And it's quite clear, already now, but uh, certainly in a very near future, water will be the limiting factor. That's no question. Simply because of the number, but we have to know also the way of using water has changed. We have industry, we have uh, growing living standards in the urban areas. Uh, that means the amount per capita of water is the need for it has increased. And in addition, uh, water quality is a very, very big problem. The quality is rapidly going down. Salination is a problem, but also pollution, which is absolutely dramatic. We shouldn't be uh, 
we shouldn't make too uh, strong recommendations on this. Our rivers were very dirty as well. It took maybe decades somehow to clean it. Uh, Pakistan at the moment is still in a position where the water quality <coughs> rapidly goes down. So for, my, for me it's absolutely clear that this whole situation will be uh, of highest uh, uh, relevance. Just two short uh, <coughs> illustrations to what happens now. Don't look at the, the units here, that's million acre feet, that's an old British measure. I never know how many cubic meter or cubic kilometer it is. Uh, you can, of course, transfer. Anyway, it shows the runoff of uh, Indus River, including, uh, well, diversion, but no, sorry, I have to make it clear. The, the amount of diversions into the irrigation system, that's what is here uh, in uh, red, and in yellow or white, it shows how much water finally entered the Arabian Sea from this whole system. And it's quite clear, and this has meanwhile increased, that all in all we have in the last years a slight reduction of uh, the overall availability of water, but we have zero flow into the Arabian Sea. That means we have a number of years now where no water anymore reaches the Arabian Sea. That means also that the tail end farmers in this system simply didn't get any more water for irrigation. That's a, a real, real difficult situation. The other point is uh, you can see what it means if the Indus doesn't reach any more uh, the Arabian Sea or simply in a reduced amount. Now the tidal uh, movements, the daily tidal movements uh, have a little bit more free space into it. And what can be observed is uh, what is in the red, <coughs> the red uh, arrows here. The salination of the groundwater, the penetration of the ground uh, of salted, salinated groundwater into the agricultural area is rapidly uh, increasing and going forward. That means here we have a reduction of usable land, and the same actually happens also here because there is not enough water for irrigation. Evaporation means salination of the surface. So. In this context now, in this situation where everybody says water becomes our problem. In 2007, uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, made their very, very famous uh, forecast, 2035, and that's now uh, wording from the report. Glaciers in the Himalaya are receding faster than in any other part of the world. The likelihood of them disappearing by the year 2035 and perhaps soon is very high. I just come back to this uh, because it has been uh, corrected afterwards. But that was really a, a, an announcement which was shocking for this area. They said, we have such big problems, now this uh, <coughs> adds to the problems and how to solve it. Anyway, it was very clear. <laughs> And it is still clear, I have to say, it's not solved. There are, is really action needed. Also in German politics, we sometimes say that actions must be now pushed forward in some fields, but here it's really, really vital. One, the first point is quite clear. It, the efficiency of the irrigation system has to be improved. Upgrading of the infrastructure. After the floods, many of these barrages, of these uh, channels have been destroyed. They must be uh, repaired, they must be upgraded, their efficiency must be upgraded. Second point, uh, Pakistan became a cotton exporting country. Cotton is quite a water consuming crop and uh, even wheat exporting it sometimes uh, towards Afghanistan or so. It became quite clear there must be ways, uh, there must be efforts to introduce more uh, water, as crop varieties which need less water. 
their agricultural research is uh, actually uh, a challenge for this and they make progress in many respects, you know, but still it's a, it's a big problem. Desalination of soils. Uh, the ground water management is uh, something which is very, very uh, important because uh, in addition to the general irrigation, ground water uh, uh, retrieving uh, of you know, pumps and things like this are very much uh, uh, in fun or yeah, functioning and it means that again there's a big difference between the availability of water in the Punjab compared to Sindh or here in the west part uh, Beluchistan. Uh, here in this area they have sometimes too much water and uh, they use it for, of course, for many purposes. There is a lot of evaporation as well. Whereas in this area, it should be uh, increased the runoff in order to wash out also the salt in the grounds. That means we have a, a big, big differences in salination of the soils between the upper part and the lower part here. So this can somehow be regulated by the management of the runoff here. Then increased storage capacities, big dams, small dams in the mountain areas to store water up there. I just will come back to this in a, in a minute. And then, of course, uh, what is discussed, you can read it every day in the, in, uh, in the a new or in the media in Pakistan, a new water economy which includes water rights, uh, defined shares for agriculture, how much is, can be used for urban, for industrial use, energy production, what has to be remained or left unused uh, due to ecological reasons, and so on. And then, of course, in this context, uh, the transboundary management of the water, that means Indian, but also in, in the higher areas, uh, China, has been included of Afghanistan in the West, um, the re a revision of the bilateral treaties. And then, of course, this is only possible if you have enough uh, reliable uh, institutions in the country, if uh, the uh, empowerment of the institutions is secured, which is at the moment uh, a rather a difficult situation. Just to show two, three slides on the dams. There, is, uh, there was evidence and that started in the British Times to build storage capacities just at the outlet uh, of the rivers out of the mountains in order to have uh, the surplus uh, of water immediately after melting uh, snow times or melting glaciers to store it here and slowly distribute it when it's needed but also to uh, produce energy. Tarbela Reservoir is the biggest one, uh, still up to now, the biggest one, which uh, was, uh, became effected, uh, effective in the early 70s, and which is really a very, very impressive structure, even on this Google Earth system. Now, there's one problem, because these waters, which feed uh, all these dams, but also the low ones, <coughs> which originates in the mountains. They have a lot of uh, silt, Schwebstoff, uh, what is Suspended load. Suspended load, thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, the suspended load from you know, glacial um, uh, melting uh, runoff and so on is very, very high. We have, we have seen it on the pictures before, rather arid uh, slopes in the mountains very steep slopes uh, when you reach Khoistan and the surface erosion is quite intensive. So uh, suspended load is very significant and it's uh, already uh, 10 years back or even more than 10 years back that it became very obvious that uh, this Tarbela, and it's not the only one, but Tarbela will be uh, covered rather soon or filled with uh, sediments rather soon. And you see here it's a cross uh, section, that's uh, the, the dam on this side and uh, it goes valley up here and this was the maximum operational level of the lake. That was the original uh, surface 
uh, ground surface of the lake, and meanwhile uh, we have huge masses of sediments in the lake, and it's very clear, and it's predicted that within some maybe 30 years it will be more or less full. Just in brackets, a question which now the uh, KIT in Karlsruhe is studying, what does actually happen once a lake is full with sediments? What will happen? And they have uh, the idea, just in brackets, once it's full, the, the rivers will overflow the wall. And uh, Indus, in, in, when it has peak water, peak runoff, has some 10,000 cubic meters per second. This will immediately erode the whole uh, basement of these walls and then you have a thousand of cubic kilometers uh, of mud just flowing out. Actually mud which also built up the Indus plain in earlier times. It's not new, but it, it's now a day's of course a catastrophe. Anyway, there are plans now uh, to go Indus upward and to build a series of new big dams in all different purposes, of course. Storage for water, quite clear. Energy production, quite clear. But also to hold back the sediments in the mountain itself. Well, it extends the problem, it doesn't solve it, it extends it, but uh, these are the plans. Uh, just to give a few ideas, you see Tarvena here, that's the one we just have seen, complete 1974. Dasu is planned, Basha Dam up here is uh, officially under construction for maybe almost a decade. Actually, there are political problems, uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, took back their uh, funding uh, assurance or uh, securing funds and so on due to political problems. Then India was intervening because they said, well, that's part of Kashmir. This is unless we have international uh, uh, secured situation, uh, you are not allowed to build here and so on. This one, uh, this is also planned and this one here is Skardu. I just learned who is going to Pakistan uh, in the near future. You. That's uh, Skardu and Baltistan uh, is in this area. And I just got a very nice slide from a colleague, Professor uh, Hauptmann from Heidelberg, from uh, the academies there. It shows, uh, it's eastward looking, that's Indus, well it flows like this. That is this oasis Skardu here, uh, quite a big irrigation, that is Baltistan, Shiga and so on. Again, you see all these oases in here, and the idea is to have a dam on this side and flooding this whole area here. And this is now nicely made. You see this will all be flooded. So you can imagine there's a big discussion between the lowlands, which say, hey, we have uh, big needs, we need water, we need energy. There are mountains far away, remote steep, snowy, nobody lives there, and so on, so we make big lakes. And, of course, people living here, in these areas, and, by the way, the very famous Karakorum Highway actually touches these areas as well, linked to China. It's a strategic road, you know. Uh, they say, please, forget about this, we don't, uh, we cannot accept it, even if you reimburse us and give some, uh, compensation somewhere in the lowlands, because there is no spare land here. Anyway, that is one thing, and as I mentioned, Hauptmann, as uh, the author of these pictures, I showed just a second uh, a slide, also from this uh, research group in Heidelberg. There are tens of thousands of rock carvings from the Buddhist time, uh, second to fifth century, sometimes to seventh century, which are part of the cultural heritage of this area. They would be flooded, they would disappear under sediments and so on. So it's a big discussion on this as well. Now let's come back to IPC, what I just said before. That was their statement, how it was published. Quite soon after this uh, publication, 
uh, IPCC uh, rejected it uh, due to an international uh, contradiction on the scientific side, which said it's impossible, that's not realistic. So, uh, IPCC has declared it was a mistake, uh, we take it back. But, of course, the question is now, if not in 2035, what does happen? Would, what would be a more reliable state? Are they disappearing or not? And when, if yes, when? And if not, why not? And uh, I would say that's now a little bit cynical what I would <coughs> hear. Um, I would say it was quite a lucky uh, Iranian state, uh, statement for research because it was quite clear. Research was now uh, under pressure. It was asked, please find out what happens here. What are the forecasts? Well, I, I hurry up. Okay. Um, so, as a matter of fact, a number of research projects now started. Mainly, and this is uh, maybe the important or interesting thing, from international research groups. From the United States, from Britain, Germany, Japan are very active. The Italians are extremely active in this area. Chinese groups came in, some Pakistani groups as well. And everyone got somewhere funds, you know, for a defined program run in and started to carry out research. Now, that's what I would like to shortly outline here. Maybe we have to come back, what are the questions, what should be in the Karakorum has reduced or is dramatically reduced? There were phases where it advanced, when it went back, and so there's dynamic in it. But today, nowadays, it has dramatically reduced. At the same time, you find, and I showed it before, a number of glaciers which do exactly the opposite, which are advancing, like this glacier here, and you see the dimensions. These are 10 kilometers, so maybe 25 kilometers of length, and this glacier is advancing. It's uh, labeled now the battery is out. You don't have another one. No, I just solved the problem. Oh, your battery. Now I... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no it's done. <coughs> Forget it. I just tried to say. You can see this glacier with the structure uh, on the mo of the moraines, which show there's a dynamic in it. This glacier is advancing. So the question, what happens? Is it an anomaly here, or is it typical, or behind it. I show you another picture what the consequences are, uh, are of these uh, obviously retreating glaciers in the area. Now um, it's again from Google, it's a picture May 2010 up the Hunza area. You can see uh, glaciers coming down and maybe uh, I hope you can see these glaciers are also retreating. You see the moraines here, that means the surface of the glacier is obviously uh, melting away or reducing, the volume is, is reduced. Uh, the same happens here, there are a number of glaciers. Now, the question is, what are the consequences for the people there? You can see there is a, well, one has to explain it, this is an irrigated uh, oasis as we have seen before. These in this area are also uh, it's not so clearly visible, irrigated areas. And when you consider the question where the water comes from, you can clearly see that those uh, oases which uh, are fed by the runoff, the main runoff of the glacier, they are still rather secure. This uh, glacier is melting away, but it provides water. For how long? That's another question. Those higher uh, located uh, irrigated fields, which were fed from the side moraines, uh, runoff from uh, these uh, side moraines where, uh, and fed these um, channels, fed the areas here. Now, once the glacier is reducing, these channels are not anymore, uh, they don't reach anymore uh, the, uh, the runoff or the melting glaciers. That means on a small scale, this fact that many, many of the glaciers are reducing 
have consequences within the mountain systems as well. It's plus minus a decision. Those can live quite easily, those have to leave their country or their fleets. Another question, which I uh, find should uh, be focused now in the research. The question is, one, if the glaciers would disappear, what would be the reduction of the runoff of Indus? And you can see, these are rather recent uh, publications. Imbersale, who is uh, uh, his, uh, 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 a Dutch colleague, produced one paper after the other. He calculated uh, there would be a minor reduction of the overall runoff of Indus if the glaciers would not be here anymore. We still have annual seasonal snow cars and so on. World Bank, in their forecast, had a much more dramatic figure. More difficult and maybe more significant is the question, what is the contribution of the different sources of, uh, run uh, of runoff? From glaciers, from seasonal snow, from rainfall, and again, here, you see that the figures are dramatically changed. Uh, uh, the variation of figures is dramatic. Here we say 45%, uh, here 60 to 80% from glaciers, uh, by a Pakistan colleague, and so on. All in all, to make it simple, a big uncertainty in all these uh, statements. Now, a group of, an international group of scientists uh, somehow sat together and tried to define what should be the questions we have to study. And I quickly go through, it's quite clear, uh, just what I have mentioned before, what are the contributions and uh, no, what is the, the input in this uh, hydrologic system? Rainfall, snow, what, how is the evaporation in these arid uh, mountain areas? What are the gradients, horizontal, vertical gradients of these different uh, uh, variables? And it's quite clear that there are no automatic weather stations or just a few. It should be uh, established a special network of automatic weather stations. Then the question we just have discussed before, contribution of these. What's the dynamics of the sneasel snow color? It's like in our mountains, there's an annual variation of it. The type of glaciers, I will show you just uh, one example afterwards. There are many different types of glaciers, deeply covered, not covered at all, uh, avalanche fed, uh, wind blown fed uh, glaciers, and so on. The dynamics, especially the question where do we have surging glaciers, rather new, that was not even a central topic in the IPC report, is the impact of black carbon. It's very obvious, and those who are familiar with the air or those who have a chance to fly over it, the Atmospheric pollution from the lowlands is dramatic. You know, it's really uh, an absolutely dramatic situation by industri industrial uh, uh, proce processes, but also by burning forests, burning uh, you know harvest uh, rests and so on. So on. It's a huge. And uh, Beijing these days gives you an example. You know, impact of black carbon on the glaciers, changing their albedo and so on. Then, uh, the question, of course, is that nowadays, these days, you can do a lot with remote sensing, mapping the seasonal snow cover. You use physical models. There are very uh, sophisticated uh, mass balance models uh, for glaciers nowadays available. But one of the problems is there are only little in situ measurements. And there may be also for geographers, where we come from, might be a chance to work as well in this area. Um, sorry, I just... Uh, it's quite clear that IPCC makes available a set of scenarios and it's quite clear once we have understood these things we should apply them on the IPCC scenarios. And uh, after all, uh, the inclusion of proxy data showing a long term distribution uh, uh, development is very basic. I show you now uh, one or two uh, pictures of these glaciers. That is one of our main uh, 
uh, research area, Patura Glacier, which gives you an impression also on the dimensions. We are here roughly on 3,500 meters, and the so-called Patura wall in the background is almost 8,000 feet as high, uh, meters high. That means it's a huge uh, mountain system. And it's quite clear, that's what I said before, uh, this glacier is fed not only by uh, normally falling snowfall and so on, but on clear days you have constantly this blowing uh, snow drifting across the ridges, quite clear. 8,000 meters or 7,000 meters goes up to 400 hectopascal, where you have very high speed, wind speeds, jet streams and so on. So it's a totally uh, changing situation, which also creates avalanches, as you can see on this picture there, feeding these glaciers. These are processes usually in the models are not at all uh, considered. Here is another example, the same glacier now looking downward, and you can see that you have a portion of it which is debris free, uh, debris -free ice, but although this is glacier, also this one here, it's uh, completely covered with stones, and this changes the albedo, and that means the reaction towards melting processes and so on. To include all this into models is quite a challenging thing. Now, it's quite clear uh, that you can set up some kind of a conceptual model like this, showing you know the mountain, glacier here, debris covered, debris free. You have a seasonal snow cover. In winter, it's down here. In summer, it's up here, uh, fluctuating. And finally, the question is, which portion of this dynamics contributes to the runoff out here? Uh, glacial runoff by melting glacier, nival runoff by uh, the seasonally melting snow cover, pluvial runoff by uh, rainfall events, one should add permafrost which is changing now, and so on. And this of course all in all is steered or controlled by a number of processes, atmospheric processes, I said drifting snow avalanches, how much uh, is the total rainfall, how much is evaporation, impact of black carbon, and all this should be somehow understood and put into this. Now, I simply give you one example which uh, we update uh, continuously. Most of the models rely on some input data, and I simply show one. You know, that is such a model very simplified, it's, uh, it has been developed in Sweden and in, at the ETH in Zurich. You know, it shows uh, the glacier, the snow cover, release of their moisture into the soil, groundwater finally run off, and the input, precipitation, uh, temperature, then evaporation, and so on, that is all shown in this. And simply, the question of precipitation, which is a, is a basic, or one of the basic inputs, shows how different values are actually applied to produce such a runoff which only occasionally is measured. So it's an extremely hypothetical situation. Why do we have such a big difference? For instance, if you take the uh, data from the Pakistan Meteorological Department, 367 or four, say roughly 400 on an average for this area, if our own figures, Weyer, Stefan Weyer's, uh, almost double the amount now uh, supported by a very new publication here, why is these differences? It's very simple. Most of the stations are of course located where you have a village or a settlement. They are in the valleys. The valleys are dry. And this situation is not extrapolatable into the heart. In the total area, there are literally no stations in high altitudes. So, uh, just again to show you this uh, example of the Batura Glacier. Nowadays, say maybe some, some, uh, well, now meanwhile, five to seven years ago, it started that research groups came in, and I simply would like to say you the confusion of the situation. 
you see figures. Uh, our uh, program on this glacier started in 95, and these are some climatic stations here, ranging between roughly 2,000 meters up to 4,000 meters. Uh, we have a runoff station here installed to measure the runoff glacier. Then the Chinese came in in 2010. Uh, these are the red uh, climatic stations. Uh, there's a big discussion who installs up there. Are these the Chinese or will the University of Bonn make this station up there? Quite unclear. Then you see VAPTA, that's the water and uh, power production uh, development agency, uh, MET department and so on. The Pakistani agencies as well came in. <coughs> the question is how are we program linked to each other. And I simply can say everyone does uh, his own study. There's literally uh, or minimal exchange between these groups. Uh, and that is really one of the main concerns. How can you bring all these uh, teams on one table? The result is also that you have totally different uh, uh, installation types. Up here on the, on the top left is one of our stations. Uh, you know, these, there's a Japanese station here, there is uh, the station from the weather department, here one of the Chinese rain gauges, so different methods, different places, duplication and so on. It's a question of organization on an international level, which is very, very difficult. Now, let me come back to this uh, uh, small uh, model here. You can see uh, basic equations, and then, sorry, it's in reality much more complex, I know, but you know, the runoff somehow is defined by atmospheric and cryospheric uh, variables, precipitation, evaporation, change in storage, um, I don't go into the details. Nevertheless, we are, we tried to establish some kind of a vertical uh, rainfall distribution, or I have to say it in another way, uh, which altitudinal belt contributes to the runoff by melting snow, melting glaciers, and so on. And we came to the conclusion that uh, has been published only several years ago, that somewhere we have very little input in the low uh, altitudes, which perfectly is in line with what the uh, Met Department measures, and so on. Then we have an increase going up uh, maybe to an area around 5,000 meters, and from there, upwards uh, the contribution of specific runoff is reduced again. So we have a very specific uh, vertical gradient. Interestingly enough, uh, Ken Hewitt, one of the long-term researchers up there, came to a rather similar conclusion, uh, but based on totally different observations. He made snow pits, uh, you know, digging holes uh, into the snow cover, uh, defining uh, the amount of pressing water which is contained in it, and, but all in all came to a rather similar altitudinal uh, distribution. Now since we have installed now runoff stations which were really missing in this area, uh, especially on one of the glaciers we are observing, now for three years we have runoff data. If we go back, there was one uh, British group working in the 90s and in the context of the construction of Karakoram Highway, where Batura Glacier destroyed the highway by pushing forward, the Chinese have also made one of the uh, measurements. And you can see, well, I don't go into the details now, obviously there was some more runoff in these times, we measured a little bit less, maybe it's a methodological problem, no? Anyway, if we calculate back what would be the average input of, uh, uh, of rainfall. And if you assume that the evaporation that's mentioned up there uh, is in the range of 200 millimeters, we must get much, much more rainfall compared to what is available up to now. You see, these are calculated figures, uh, which are double, three, four times higher than what is uh, available up to now. So the question is, What's going on? 
we see melting glaciers, we see circling glaciers, we have totally different uh, input data for rainfall based on the runoff data. Somehow we must have obviously a vertical, uh, uh, vertical different processes here. Growing conditions in the higher altitudes reducing the conditions in the lower. It could make sense if we have, and that's observed, slightly increased temperatures. Also the amount of water vapor in the, in the atmosphere is increased. That means we might, even if you have high temperature, we might have quite significantly more uh, snowfall in the higher areas where nobody has proper observations. Now we uh, uh, calculated uh, new gradients, again I don't go into the details, uh, a gradient it's a little bit too linear, I know, but obviously the potential rainfall increases very much with the high altitudes, maybe even 3,000 millimeters per year, which is absolutely out of the range of uh, what has been measured. Now, and I soon approach the end, the end. Don't worry. There's uh, just in the last year, a few uh, articles have been published mainly in Nature Geoscience or in Nature and Science uh, based on totally new, uh, well, based on another approach. Uh, they used um, um, laser uh, satellite sensors which. Uh, provide you very accurate altitudinal uh, information. And they compared, in this case it was a comparison of two data sets from 2000 and 2008, so eight years in between, by a group, Gardel, uh, from Grenoble uh, and uh, colleagues. And they came to this conclusion for the central and western Karakorum. You, here you have the altitude from 3,000 to 6,500 meters and uh, on this scale you have a difference between the scenes 2000 and 2008 in altitude. So it's, uh, it's the change between these two. And what's interesting is that we, if you look on these uh, lines here, that in the lower parts we obviously have a reduction uh, of the uh, surface elevation, whereas in higher altitude we have positive values. It's growing up there, which supports what I just suggested before. Then the second point, which is indicated here, with these lines going up, down, or this one here, like this, where you have within a few years a very dramatic increase of uh, mass up to more than 100 meters. Has the uh, elevation of the glacial grown. These, and just before it was reduced. These are typical surging glaciers which move very rapidly down and in a wave which is propagating. So all in all, the conclusion that in the high altitudes we obviously have another type of uh, mass balance compared to the lower parts, I think somehow it becomes being proved. Now again, a group, uh, a CAB, originally from the ETH Zurich, now in uh, Bergen, Oslo, they made it for the whole of the Himalaya and they came to a very interesting conclusion. The same methodology, on a very rough, very uh, generalized way. They could show, and this is indicated uh, in the, with the colors up there, you see uh, the red one is a reduction of ice and snow masses, surface reduction by almost one meter per year, is it lowering? Whereas in the blue uh, area down there it's growing. And it comes clearly out that we have a regional differentiation. The Karakorum up there, where we actually at the moment have our main uh, research area, is growing. It's the so-called Karakorum anomaly, whereas the majority of all glaciers are in fact disappearing or reducing, not disappearing, but very much reducing. It's quite clear. The answer 
we are in the monsoonal systems here. It's very much linked to the uh, fluctuations of the monsoonal system from the south. Whereas in Karakorum, like in the Pamir or so, we are in the uh, atmospheric circulation system of the westerlies, which come in here, which bring uh, air masses from the Mediterranean uh, area and uh, have totally different uh, characteristics. There are wind precipitations up there, whereas here in the monsoonal area you have May, June, where you have the majority of the import. Now, and these are almost the last pictures now, we almost, we also, that's quite clear for climatologists, short-term observations uh, are important, they help to understand what's going on, but we have to have a, a long-term uh, look as well. And uh, there are a number of studies, and I'm very proud that uh, members of, of the, our uh, Dendro lab now spread all over Germany and Switzerland, uh, that is Kerstin Dreite, but Jan Esper and so on, Burkhard Neuwitz sitting here, uh, managed to ev uh, evaluate the last 1,000 years based on juniper tree rings, annual analysis of the isotopes and where you can deduct the, the humidity conditions and it was very impressive and that's the upper curve now I have to jump or climb on a, <laughs> on a chair. You see for the last 1,000 years and it ends in 1998, these were the, that was the year where we have taken the samples. Uh, these are indexed values, it shows the humidity conditions you see. We have obviously an increase in humidity at higher altitudes in the last, how much is it, 150 years. Which is now underlined by some of these glacial observations. Whereas before there were fluctuations, drier, more humid ones and so on. So we have, of course, the natural fluctuations now superimposed by human impacts. The other curves I read apart. For me, and uh, that's now the consensus in this uh, program, it's quite clear. We have only a chance to understand what's going on and also to make reliable, say, scenarios uh, if we combine the different scales. If we combine global regional scale information, which is mainly satellite data, uh, up there, general atmospheric input, then the topography, general glacial models, and so on. If we combine this global data sets with the regional ones, finally, a regional really focused on individual cases to understand what's going on, where we need, of course, again, the high resolution topographic rule control. We have to have very uh, adapted local glacial models. We need precise meteorological input data. We need proxy data, what I just showed uh, before. And again, we must combine it. And we have to focus, that's what is mentioned here, on vertical gradients, which are up to now still very unknown. And it's only possible if we include field studies and something which is completely missing. Whatever uh, publication you read, whatever uh, data sets you get from MET department, it's never said how accurate actually these data are. I simply, I'm more and more careful with the data we get for our study. Second last picture. This now becomes, as I said, a real issue first on individual, of individual research groups, now it becomes an issue which is internationally coordinated. And there's a quite uh, clear consensus and mainly uh, coordinated by ICIMOD, the International Centre of Integrated Integral Mountain Development, which covers this whole area. We should focus on case studies, Indus is one, Kailash, Kozi, Myanmar on this, with Brahmaputra, Samvin, where we have to define what are the problems, what are the methods we would like to uh, apply so that we can compare what is outcoming. And it's quite clear 
This relates to international programs which are already for many, many years uh, uh, going on. Also, not the details, all these mountain areas with a different significance in terms of runoff for their uh, forelands uh, somehow are nowadays uh, confronted with these uh, uh, problems. With this, I would like to close my contribution. It shows, maybe as a last image, the, the importance of vertical gradients. Climatic stations are usually down in the desert of the Indus Valley in this case, whereas the water resources in the case of Mangabara are high up and not known yet. So, thanks a lot for your attention.